<laughs> well, thank you for having me. Um, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about, so I can get um, excited and off script pretty easily. And I'll uh, try not to. Um, but it literally is an answer to prayer uh, to be with you. We came out of our global LDHI meeting in South Africa a few weeks ago. And one of the things that became clear as, as our global priority, we really want to, we want to intentionally develop Christ-centered, adaptive leaders for missional impact. And that really affects every uh, department, every aspect of the ministry, whether you're at the country level or the local level or the area level. What is it that we need to invest in? Uh, how is it that we need to invest in our people so that they are the best they can be for what God's called us to do, right? So um, I was talking about, so we just need to pray that God would create like a hunger uh, for leaders to actually want to see this happen. And a week or two later, I got this invitation and I got another one to an area conference on the same topic. So I'm thankful to you for raising it and I'm thankful to God for answering it. Before we dive into any content, I kind of wanted to get an idea about um, what questions you have, or what are the tensions you experience when you think about this topic. Um, what is it we could cover today that would help you take the next steps that you need to take as a leader to intentionally develop your team members? <coughs> And that's a real question. And I'm patient. <laughs> I think sometimes we have, we have a tendency to go very fast, very quickly. And one of the things that I know we've been, with my team that I work on, is how do we pause more, and keeping with the spirit, how do we pause more to allow space for prayer around the proposition, and all these things, kind of what's that balance of, we want to be efficient workers, but we want to do it in the spirit, and with the Lord's leading. Okay, so you've been carving out time for developing people. Seems like it could be a pressure or a tension. So what's unique about us when we think about developing our leaders that's different from the libraries full of leader development books, of which I have many. <laughs> okay, that'll be fun to talk about. One thing for me I've noticed in the, in the position focus process is getting to the KDA, I struggle to like, okay, what is it? Um, I've noticed other people can do that really naturally. Mm -hmm. hey, I have this vision for you. I think you should do this. So is there some framework or key questions to consider to help people that that doesn't like come as naturally to? Okay. That's a good one. And um, hope, <coughs> let me know as we're going through. Mm -hmm. There's, there's Maybe the part of this that we'll, we'll actually address some of that, but I want to make sure it's adequate. Great. Anything else? Let's say how, how much do we incorporate um, leadership development explicitly for everyone in our team versus kind of focusing in on, say, a handful that maybe have more leadership potential or whatever. So are we going to teach you to discuss how we are developing leaders uh, in our teams or is this also about our own leadership development? Or um, have we all that. arrived? Sure. I mean, you know, a lot of you have arrived, but I haven't. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how do I think about my own development mm -hmm. yeah. in this question? Yeah. yeah, because the change scenario that um, we were talking about over the lunch table, to me, is one of those prime mm -hmm. opportunities where uh, you're being challenged to do something new. You haven't done it before. Your department mm -hmm. hasn't done it um, that way before. You're having to adapt to a new reality, 
And that is fertile ground for personal growth. So you kind of look at it and you go, okay, here we are. What, what are the new priorities uh, now? Uh, what has to change from what I was doing? So you can't actually maintain the status quo. This is one of the tensions that came up. You've got a bunch of projects that are ongoing and you're introducing change. What does the normal curve look like when you introduce change? There's a dip, right? And it's, it's legit because you're having to learn and invest energy in those things that are new. Um, at the same time, you're trying to maintain it. So in almost any change, there's no way to maintain the same level of productivity and or commitment as you had previously. Uh, talking about that will give you a lot of you freedom to kind of look at where do I adjust. Um, but in a sense, if you're in a new job or you have new responsibilities on top of former uh, or previous responsibilities, you almost have to take, if you use uh, your schedule, uh, the plate as a metaphor for your schedule, you almost have to clear everything off and go, okay, what goes on now? I'm leading people I haven't led before. Hmm. Okay, how to maintain for that? I, I have to read more broadly than I did before. Hmm. How do I make time for that? And who can pick up this stuff that <laughs> I can no longer uh, do in the same way that I did it before? So there's a lot of tensions that are in this uh, scenario that you're in now that are really ripe for your own development. Uh, paying attention to that would be good. But I'm hoping the principles that we'll do today um, you can also think about for your own growth, as well as for those you lead. Okay? Well, that's a good list. Uh, and hopefully, we'll see if we can kind of work them all uh, into where we're going. Thank you for sharing. Lord, we're just going to ask right now that um, you would walk us through uh, these ideas in a way that um, you would help them take root in the hearts of the people here. You help us. In, uh, be able to apply them in ways that are going to make a difference in the lives of the people that we lead, mm -hmm. and that we create the kind of culture in DPS that will be um, full of grace mm -hmm. and full of truth, and resulting in lots of growth and tremendous faithfulness with a deep faith in you. Mm -hmm. So we ask, Father, that this time we go toward that, and that you would direct my words and thoughts in that direction. We ask, too, that if there's um, things coming up that need to be addressed that I'm not picking up on, that um, you'd stir the people in the room to ask those questions. So we lift up this time to you and trust you to answer. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I want you to think for a moment <coughs> with me. Uh, when have you grown the most as a leader? I'd like you to just turn to a neighbor and think about this. What was true of that situation? What did the leaders around you say and do to encourage your development? So, in pairs, or threes, if you got an odd number. I'm going to give you about three minutes. Okay. What were some of the things that were true of the situation where you grew the most? <clears throat> Just popcorn. Hard circumstances, like overwhelming or strenuous tension. Hard circumstances, something very challenging. Yeah? Adversity. Adversity. Kind of just jumping in or diving into the situation that or maybe being forces you to in. kind of <laughs> grow. Yeah. Jumping in or uh, being put in a situation that's up you're in over your head, the deep Conflict. end of the pool. Conflict. Conflict. Okay. Failure. Releasing the chains. Releasing the chains. Failure. Releasing the chains. More freedom. Releasing the chains. Talk to me a little bit about that. The chains. Excuse me. Chains. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's more of a leadership style thing. <laughs> in the past, they were more. They didn't. They didn't give me the freedom. Okay. Being able to get things done yeah. the way I felt like they needed to do, and then also have their backing on mm -hmm. how I did it. Okay, so. so you were sponsored, you had the backing, and you were <clears throat> empowered. You had freedom, and you knew, uh, w was it true that you knew where the boundaries were? Um, I found those out. <laughs> 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 I 
<laughs> you got it. <laughs> okay. Well said. Well said. Anybody else? Never in isolation. Always with other people. Always with other people. Not in isolation. Anything else? Okay, interesting, interesting array um, of answers here because we heard a lot of things that are hard, basically, right? Uh, difficult circumstances, conflict, um, probably the best case scenario was being believed in and uh, empowered, right? I asked the same question to a group of leaders from another part of the world um, a few years ago, and it was amazing to watch what happened in the room because the energy level went up about 10 times what it had been. They became very animated and very energized. And oh, it was amazing. And they were reliving the experience as they were talking about it. And they said some things like, oh, uh, I was given a really, uh, a really difficult challenge. Uh, somebody believed in me and challenged <coughs> me um, in there. And then there was the whole spectrum of they supported me, they didn't support me. They gave me feedback, they gave me no feedback. I was on my own, I had the resources I needed. And so the circumstances were quite wide. It became apparent in that conversation was as they were reliving that situation, I realized they didn't see themselves now as the senior leader who could give the challenge, who could believe in people, and who could sponsor people. And so before we move on, I want to make that clear. <laughs> you are the person who can give the challenges. And whether it's throwing them in, or placing them in, or inviting them in, uh, you have the ability to sponsor people, to encourage them, to release them, uh, to support them to the degree that you think is necessary for their own growth. And finding that balance between um, the, probably the people that you're working with that are leaders are not going to need their hands held. Uh, they're going to need some, some space. So how do I, as a leader, begin to enter that space with them? But I don't want to move on before we kind of look at it and go, you're leading a team. This is one of your primaries. People have been entrusted to you. They're our most valuable resource. So we want to take not just good care of them in terms of morale, but we want we want to steward the gifts that have been entrusted to them and to us as a whole uh, to do the best uh, we can toward them. Does that make sense? Okay, so Matt, this is kind of the point you were raising. I think the key to developing people is understanding that you're moving someone from A to B. And the challenge a lot of times is envisioning the B. Like, what is it that this person uh, can become? Uh, who can they become in terms of their character? What are they capable of doing? What is their capacity? You know, is this a, um, an individual who has expertise and they are best left to that expertise versus managing people? Or do they have the kind of ability to take somebody uh, to take a team of people and lead them to places they've never been before, right? You're trying to discern all of that. One of the, um, I forget who said it, but um, some coach somewhere said one of the keys to kind of running your place on any sports team is to um, be able to envision the end result. And one of the things I learned when I was learning how to play tennis at Penn State, which I haven't done since then, um, was picturing yourself getting to the place on the court where you could actually make the shot and what is the position that you need to be in. So whether you're football or basketball, soccer, or any other sport, I think you can get that idea, right? What is it um, that we want that to look like? So you can think about that from a variety of ways. Uh, one is, um, are there roles uh, that make that be? You can see this person moving into a role. Um, I'm going to come at it from a couple other angles as well. Is this a person, um, to, your, uh, to your point, does this person have leadership possibilities? How do they do working with other people? How do they, what kind of clarity do they have on the work? You can begin to look at what are the things that make up the 
leadership? You know, how does this person square against that? Um, or you could look at the person themselves and go, what does a more mature, effective, and responsible version of this person look like? Right? So there's a bunch of different ways. I'm going to ask you for the rest of this time to have one person on your team in mind. Got it? You know who it is? Okay. So we'll start with the A and just ask, how has God wired this person? What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? Um, one of the, if you want a, another angle to look at it, you can use the acronym SHAPE, which I didn't include in this, but um, that Rick Warren has in the Purpose Driven uh, Church. Spiritual gifts, what are they burdened for? What's their heart? What are their abilities? What is their personality? And what is their experience? And a lot of times you'll see threads in a person's storyline um, that God's already begun to build in them the capacities they need for what his purposes for them are, right? And I'll attach that to this um, later just so you have it. Um, are they ready and motivated? Because if someone is going to develop, that is one of the key conditions, that they actually want to grow that they want to become a better version of themselves, or they have in mind a role that they would love to fill um, in the organization. You kind of go, how do you know that? Well, you ask them. <laughs> you know, it's, it's one thing. You can do a certain amount of work yourself. I'm observing these things about this person. Great people person, delivers projects on time, um, can handle adversity pretty well. Hmm wonder what they're thinking about for the future. Good question. Where do you see yourself in five years? It's not a promise. It's an inquiry, right? But it gives you an angle into who the person is. Um, I put this very question, uh, Matt, what is your vision for this person? We used to, on a summer project, have to sit down and make a list of all the uh, students we were working and on one side of the list was every strength you could think of. And the challenge was to fill the page. Right? You probably know what projects I'm talking about. The other side is like, okay, where do they need to grow? And let's limit that to two or three things that could actually keep them. And then when you look at that list of strengths, you go, what could I see this person doing in the future? And pray. Lord. What is it that you have in mind for this person? How could I express that to them? And they, we end up with a paragraph. You know, I can see you sitting with, across the table with women, um, bringing the word to their lives, encouraging, encouraging them in their journey. I can see the impact that you can have on others as you make yourself available to the Lord. In the same way we would talk about corporate vision or movement vision, for that individual, they're fully blooming. What does it look like, right? Um, I would, I would just suggest for that individual that you're thinking about now, this is an exercise that you would do. Just sit down with a piece of paper, write out every strength uh, that you can see. Um, think about the things that are uh, areas of growth, and ask God to give you a vision for who that person can become, and what role they might fill. Future. Not that those are promises, <coughs> but it gives you an idea of uh, moving into B, right? I like to ask this question. Um, what would need to be true for this person to exercise greater responsibility, greater influence, and greater effectiveness? And I use those three because the responsibility has to do kind of with the character of being able to carry more. Um, so what would it take for this person's capacity to be greater? Uh, influence almost always has to do with relational ability. Uh, can, can this person talk about their ideas in a way that others can hear them? Uh, can this person address a difficulty with a team member? Can they raise an agenda issue that's unpopular and do it in a way that everybody kind of wants to tell them, oh yeah, we need to talk about that, right? So you begin to see like greater influence. I can have, I can walk into a situation and have the relational skills 
um, to actually exert influence. And then greater effectiveness. How do I get better at what I'm doing? Do they actually have a learning capability? Um, and are they willing to sharpen their own, uh, in a sense, sharpen their own saw? Uh, how do I keep improving on what I'm doing? Versus a kind of resting on your laurels kind of posture. Does that make sense? Um, so envision the, the bees, the bee. There are some things that we have uh, that we could use, and the core competency is one of them. That's on your end of year review. The Christ-centered example, personal maturity, team relationships, teachability, self-awareness, and job competency. That is a pretty good cluster of things that describe the kind of person that you would um, want to be working with. And I didn't put the whole description in here. But if you just looked at all the phrases in there and, and, and go, OK, how is this person on these things? Are any of these to the point of hindering this person from taking on greater responsibility or, or greater influence? Right? You can begin to look at what is it that we have, and how do I apply it uh, towards this individual that I'm working with? Then, uh, a second thing would be a leadership framework. Does this person have the ability to kind of uh, look at direction and see where we need to go? A lot of times in team discussions, you can see who that is. Because they'll be the ones that say, if we do that, we're going to miss the boat on this thing over here. You know, They can see the cause and effect. They can see the system interactions. Um, and then I put up a thing up here on uh, new team leaders. We just. Um, introduced the soft launch of this LVHR.org. And there's team leader training on it. Uh, that if you had somebody who was looking at possibly becoming a team leader, you can begin to give them some either assignments, parts of your job that uh, you would like to, you'd like to see how they do. So I go, oh, oh, I don't know how to do this part. This is my favorite <coughs> image of the year. Do you like it? <laughs> yeah, it gives me confidence as we're moving forward. I know there's a way I can drag this thing over here, but it's not my, I'm not good at it. I will try. No, we'll come back. No, I'll just leave it in the PowerPoint, and I'll give you the PowerPoint, and you can open the link later. But all that to say, LVHI.org is operative, and there's tools and processes there that you could um, use. And those links will go directly to that. So on envisioning the B, do you have some ideas for the person in your mind that you're thinking about? You know where you can look? God's good at giving answers, so if you're asking him, he'll show you. Here's some principles to think about. Assignments that are developmental usually proceed from low risk, low visibility to high risk, high visibility. So you're not taking somebody who is a rookie in the, in the area that you want them to develop and putting them on a platform with 400 people to have to explain it, right? Um, there, you want to give the kind of appropriate next developmental step. Uh, and usually that goes from small to large. The second is um, use a strength to help develop a weaker area. And I'm kind of the big proponent that you don't have people focusing on their PDP only, only in weak areas. Um, because of the third point here, people only have so much energy. And they, they need to invest them in places that will enable growth, but will also give motivation to hang in there while they're growing. Does that make sense? So if you have somebody who's working just on stuff that they feel like they're not good at, the return on energy uh, of being able to invest in it is low. If you pair it with something they're good at, um, you can begin to see, like, oh, I can do this because I'm seeing success here, and I'm having to enter into this weaker area in a smaller proportion. So I'm going to use a campus example, uh, bear with me. I had two trainees way back when, 
and uh, one came from a really strong campus background. She had ministry skills galore. Uh, could could organize anything. So uh, was amazing. She had a hard time winning people over to her point of view. Um, on the other hand, I had another trainee who had literally had no ministry experience, came from a campus where we didn't have staff. Um, but if she said something in a staff meeting, it was golden, you know? And I'm looking at it going, we have a major fall retreat for five campuses uh, coming up. And I know the one could organize it, but we needed the other one in the mix to actually make sure it happened, to have, have the alignment come, right? So put them together on it. And uh, what, what happened in the long run was fascinating to watch. So for the person that was well-trained but couldn't get the point across, watching the other person function in a staff meeting and going, how come when I say, say things, things don't go anywhere? And being able to have that developmental conversation. Okay, what are you seeing? What's different? Where do you feel like you need to grow? person on the other hand who uh, had all of the sort of woo, but not the organizational side, was like, okay, how do we learn how to do that? And the two of them together, like, were each other's, like, development buddies. That's what I mean by putting people, you can put people together or you can have people work on things. The, the gal that was great at organizing, that thing was a phenomenal success. And the woman who had very little ministry experience, but a lot of people sense, made it as fun uh, and spiritually significant as it could be. Uh, and the two of them together were a great tandem. So I look at that and go, that's the kind of example. <coughs> where you go, you're putting somebody in a good spot, but they're having to grow. And I think the Lord used that way beyond my expectations, even, right? So when you think about that area where the person needs to grow, you're also wanting to expand a strength. It's possible to do that simultaneously. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, but as much as you can, it's helpful. Then we get into the five E's. How familiar are all of you with these? I'm seeing some nods, some no's. Okay. So we'll walk through them, and um, those of you who are familiar with it, I'd like you to be thinking of examples of how you've seen this operate um, in different situations. So the first one, this these came out of a conversation <coughs> uh, in the 90s. We were sitting around a table and going, how can we build a kind of culture of development? These five E's came out of it. Somebody got on a roll of the alliteration, and it stuck. Um, what, what kind of environment do we need um, in order to see people developing? One, it's holistic. We're looking at the whole person, uh, not, not just their work. We have concern for their character. One of the things that's unique about us is that who we are is the bedrock of what we do. I'd say even in technical fields. We're, we're all sitting there going, how do we make Jesus bigger in the minds of those who are out there? And how does he become bigger in my life so that that's who people see? That is a uniqueness, um, and we've got to pay attention to it. It's basically the character of the organization. How we live out our faith in this place uh, should show up in every angle of what we do. Delivering projects, having truthful conversations, being encouraging, um, illuminating sarcasm, illuminating um, one-upsmanship, looking out for each other in a way that um, you wouldn't see in a corporate climb the ladder kind of um, culture. All of those things should show up here, um, who we are uh, looking at it. To do that, you need a really safe environment for growth. Uh, grace, truth, and time. I know you've heard that as a time, kind of a time-honored and time-worn phrase, perhaps. But what does it mean for you as a team leader to demonstrate to your team members that you are for them? Regardless of their performance. That you care about them, that um, you, will, you will do your best by them. Um, the same stance that God has for us. You know, let me change. Truth. 
If I had a dollar for every time um, you were not truthful in giving feedback, um, my support needs would be over. <laughs> because we're not good at this as an organization. And I will just say that across the board. Um, sometimes when the truth gets delivered, it can be blunt and like um, torture. And other times, um, it's so soft as to be unrecognizable. And there's a sweet spot in there about where you're direct um, and for the person at the same time. I care about you. This has to change. And, and those two are not in opposition to each other, right? So grace, truth, and time. What kind of process do we give people to grow? Um, I have a point on this a little bit later, but everyone needs acceptance, structure, accountability, feedback, and process, right? So your stance as a leader, I am, I am for you. I'm going to provide structure uh, in the sense that um, these are the boundaries around your work. These are the clarities. You guys work on OKRs, right? Uh, to me, you couldn't get clearer than what I've seen in some of those meetings uh, where you know what the work is and you know how to do it. Um, part of your work as a team leader is to go, how do I structure then this work of developing people in my schedule? How do I get it in there? Creating accountability and holding people to it, giving them feedback along the way. A lot of times, one of the problems with the staff development cycle, as much as I love it, is you have three formal conversations. And, and in some places, that is all the feedback that person's getting, is in those three formal conversations. And I look at it and I go, I don't know about you, but encouragement is like what I run on, right? Apart from Jesus. <laughs> you go, you just need to know that you're doing a good job along the way. And one of the things that is just very easy to do um, is to be specific about the kind of um, results that you're seeing or the work that people have put in to affirm people along the way, regardless of, of what it looks like. And then um, intentionally developing each person, selecting people for additional assignment, not based on who already has the experience, but who could do it based on potential for leadership. Um, back to you, Mandy. You look at it and you go, this person actually looks like they have some potential. Let's test it out. Dr. Bright used to say, get the cut of the person before you put them in the job. You should give them like a test run, basically. And that's what development assignments do. You're giving someone a kind of test run, right? Thinking long-term about a person's contribution and helping each one become more of whom they could be. So when I think about this, a lot of times, I don't know if this is true because you guys change so much. I'm thinking you might not be in this kind of comfortable spot. But um, in other teams, what happens the first time you mention like an admin need? Everybody has the person in mind. You know, and it's the same person every time. Why? Because they've done a fabulous job in the past. What happens over time if that is your continued pattern? The person keeps getting asked to do that, but I heard something else over here. I just said we don't see other people, opportunities in other people. You are tied to that one person's ability to do it. Right? And you look at it and you go, there's a lot of places where we could cross train so easily and have a pool of people who are ready to do some other kinds of things. So look beyond the obvious, or at least put an apprentice with the best person when they're doing it. Right? Exposure. This is really simply watching other leaders in action, hearing their stories, and demystifying leadership. Um, I was having an interview yesterday by a woman in uh, AIA who's in a class. And one of the things she said at least three times, she goes, oh, really? You do that? <laughs> I'm kind of like, yes, because leaders are human beings. you know, And we're, we all have areas of growth, strength, weakness, struggles, and stuff like that. But when you're only viewed from a platform, nobody sees that. And people make up stories about who they think you are anyway. So you kind of go, how do, how do we actually um, get a chance to know that I, too, with the struggles and with the weaknesses, could lead. It's when you hear other leaders tell their stories, right? So you telling your stories, important. Equipping. 
bringing the necessary skills and attitudes to build up the staff. Um, that includes training for their current work as well as development for future work. You know, so you think about that team member and you go, here's what they're doing now. Do they need anything to do better at what they're doing now? And then if this person had an expanded role, what could that look like and what might they need in order to do it? Right? So if you've gone from being an individual contributor and you think the person has potential to be a team leader, chances are in this group you're also going to have to maybe do some project management, look at workflow, stuff like that. You can help people get an idea about that before you ever uh, recommend them to be a team leader, right? Okay, tell me if I'm saying anything out of whack. <laughs> Experience. By far, the research shows that this is uh, this is the best development possible, and that is stretching assignments with feedback. That is one of the most powerful combinations for adult development. So use of the KDA, Key Development Assignment, in your position-focused conversation with them. It will take a little bit of creativity on your part, uh, but it creates the scenario where you can really uh, accelerate growth for that person. And that process, challenge, support, and feedback, those three things um, are the essential elements of it. Um, evaluation, giving feedback both formally and informally, um, 360 review, everyday work, everyday conversation. Uh, if you wanted to just try something for a week, uh, encourage each person on your team uh, every day over the next week and watch what happens. Just watch what happens. It's the most fun. It's about as good as developing roses, or delivering roses on Valentine's Day, which I had to do for my dad's floral shop. So, very fun. Conversations about potential and aspirations and their implications. Um, these are the kind of conversations that actually get put off because we're not exactly sure how to do it, how to do that, right? kind of go, wow, this person has potential for this, but man, this thing is killing them. Okay, if it's killing them, loving them means you're going to talk about them. You're going to talk about it with them. You know what I mean? And you're not going to wait for the merit review or the compensation review. Um, and it's, it, it's not as hard as what you think once you get in it. But you have to address patterns that hinder effectiveness or growth as a leader. Otherwise, you what happens? You start to do end runs around that person. You can't give them more work because they've got the big ugly work. You know, and, and we're not talking about that, so we'll just get somebody over here to do it. Uh-uh-uh. Stop it if you're doing that. Just stop it. Um, a lot of uh, literature would say that 70% of development is on-the-job experience. 20% is exposures to other leaders informally. So even in this kind of setting, you're getting development by exposure to each other. Um, and 10% of it might be training. Um, so you go, usually, we flip that. We'll go 70% training, maybe 20% on exposure to others, and 10% on on-the-job experience. And really, that should be the meat of your um, development stuff. OK, let me pause here and go, how are we doing? What's unique? KDA's framework, good. How much is LD for everyone versus those with potential? OK. Your own development, how are we doing? Great. Great? <laughs> OK. So we're going to talk, we'll go now into, OK, how do we make the space for it? Right? There's a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Maybe, maybe you're going to talk about this, but, so these are my questions, but you mentioned energy in terms of growing. Yeah. And I have found personally and also for my team, having two PVPs and a KDA can feel pretty heavy. Sure. From a growth perspective, so I'm curious, maybe what we're pursuing is one is two in depth. So I'm just, you know, like any any area of growth could feel very big. So I'm just curious how you think about balancing or even freezing things sometimes, right? Sure. Yeah. 
sure. So mm -hmm. right now, I just have a KDA. I don't have any other PDK goals. Because it's big and it's requiring massive amounts of attention for me to do it. <laughs> and it's about my own rest. So that tells you, like, most of the story, right? But you, you look at it and you go, uh, I think that's one of the things that you assess with the person. Like, how, how feasible are these? And sometimes we can maybe get a little too smart about the, how specific they are. And you could talk more about the measurement of it. So we'd be looking for this kind of change in a meeting um, and lighten it up a little bit. But I think that's a judgment call for you. I'm with your team members, um, how much energy they have to put into it. And I would look at the balance of positive as well as um, the weaker areas. So I do have this philosophy that all of you can be a good coach. But like Paul and Barnabas, who had two very different coaching styles, there's a lot of ways to accomplish it. Right? So you can do this. Each of you has strengths in leadership roles, key leadership roles. Some of you are good direction setters. Some of you are great change agents. Some of you are great spokespersons. Uh, if one of your people needs spokesperson ability, take them with you when you're having a meeting where you have to persuade somebody about what you're trying to see happen. Um, learn to communicate key principles of your strength area. So many times leaders uh, here are um, unconscious competence. They are good, but they don't know why they're good, and they can't articulate their strengths. Right? So if somebody says to you, gosh, you're, Tracy, you're a great coach. Go really good follow-up question. What do I do? That makes you say that. <laughs> you know, you and I had to do that with a couple of those trainees when I was asked to do a seminar on developing staff. I'm like, this is just the way I think. I don't think there's anything unique about it. And you go, that's because it's a it's a gift to you, right? But you had there's a sort of a gift blindness about what you do, and this is where you can help each other. So if you're having a table discussion about, I'd like to develop somebody in this, and someone looks at you and goes, well, you can do that. You go, whoa, 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 what am I doing that could help me do that? You know? um, and involve other people in those to the degree that it's appropriate. Right? The second thing is put these in your schedule. Um, the thing I've noticed the most is that people want to be intentional about it, but it's not reflected in their schedule. And it could be as simple as you know a coffee cup conversation in 30 minutes. It doesn't have to be a two-hour, um, you know, big PDP kind of thing. You can break up the questions that you want to ask over a period of time, but they won't happen unless you're intentional about it. So I'll just say that. And then I'd say grow your abilities to have meaningful conversations um, about the priority. Uh, this is to me the sort of I picked a couple scriptures in here Philippians 2 and 1 Thessalonians 5 um, which of course I'm going to forget now on demand but it's that come alongside and can I deliver to the person what they need whether it's encouragement or strength or release um, what is it that they need and how can I how can I give it so a lot of this stuff isn't rocket science my problem with it is it sort of takes the dedication of a rocket scientist to execute it. Can I say that again? Yes. This is not rocket science. So it's not that hard, in a sense. If you pay attention to people and you listen to them, it's not that hard. But it takes the dedication of a rocket scientist to actually do it. You have to be on it. Uh, you, you have to look at things when they're happening and realize that the best feedback is timely and, and not six months later um, or not at the end of the OKR uh, quarter. You know, Do it in the moment. Do it when it's fresh. Do it in a way that communicates that for you posture. I care about you and I want you to be your best. Um, and give as specific feedback as you can, both positive and negative. We've all been there where somebody says, oh, you did a great job. I really appreciate the way you took the time to emphasize this in particular because we really needed that. And you did it really well. It's a whole different feel, right? And it doesn't take that much. It just takes a little attention. 
Um, <coughs> some time on this, and on, maybe just hit the pause button once I finish it. But I think one of the big things that a lot of times we suffer from um, when we crew is that um, we have a, we have a challenge about patterns versus incidents, um, and how do I address things that are recurring issues? So when the same behavior has happened three or more times, and the person has been unresponsive to requests for change. It's time to change the conversation and address the pattern, the pattern of reaction versus the actual problem behavior, right? And in doing that, you can do something like, let's talk about what's happening. You know, I've asked you three times for something different, and there's no change that I can see. Um, so help me understand what's going on with you. And it's as simple as laying it out, and you're still communicating a for you thing, but going, there's a problem here, and the problem is not just this behavior. It's our interaction um, on it, how you're responding to the request for change. Um, and occasionally, you can get a, you know, a blamey person who will say, well, it's all you. And you go, well, I understand I might contribute to it, and I'd like to hear more about that. But I'd like to know what's going on in you when you're getting these requests from me. What, what's the problem? And let's talk about that. Um, you do need to have a humble posture uh, because you could be doing something uh, that you're not even aware of that's part of the mix. And so to be able to hear that is a, a generous response on your part. But you need to be able to focus on the person's need for change and to actually be specific about what that change needs to be. Um, one of the best patterns that I've seen for feedback and addressing this kind of thing is in the letters to the churches in Revelation. I know you. I know your hard work and your and endurance. But this is a problem. You've left your first love. And here's what it would mean for that to be restored. Remember the, the height from which you have fallen. And if this, and if you will do this, here's, here's what will happen. And if you don't, here's what will happen. So when we're having problem behavior with people, and you've already done kind of a number of coaching conversations around it, I think you almost need to lay it out that clearly. Um, none of us typically like to do this. And none of us necessarily uh, like to be in the midst of it. But that is what love does for people. Um, ignoring the problem doesn't help. <coughs> And then we'll start to do the end around the person. So I'll hit, I'll hit pause on that because I think this is one of the most loving things you can do to people, do for people, is to help bring something to their attention that is just in the way of the work, of their growth, of team function, or or stuff like that. Let me pause and just ask for five minutes away uh, questions or comments. What wins have you seen when you kind of bring up and are have more consistent or regular feedback for people that you know? Mm -hmm. Would have been the wins when you have more consistent feedback? Um, I, I think when it gives confidence, um, it, it affirms competence, which helps breed confidence um, in a person. So when you're giving feedback regularly, uh, confidence, competence, simple appreciation for work that's done well. Um, says somebody's noticing. A lot of people around here put in extra extra effort all the time. Um, and it I I've, I've watched it be incredibly meaningful to people when you actually take the time to call it out. Um, very simple things um, that that you can do that costs nothing when it comes to LD budget, but take you miles in terms of what people will do with their discretionary effort when they have a choice in the future. To me, the biggest that is one of the biggest payoffs, uh, and I hate to even put it in that category, because if you're trying to build a culture where people are being developed and people will become all they can be, what is the natural result? I'm in. I'm in till we're finished, and I'll do whatever it will take 
to see us accomplish this. Well, that doesn't come by itself. That comes because our arms are linked. Someone knows what I'm doing. It matters. Someone's measuring it. I know whether I'm doing a good job or not. That's what leaders do. They instill that kind of confidence, of appreciation, of uh, uh, esprit de corps, uh, that we're in this and we're going to work together to see it happen. Yeah. You have a team of peers on the executive team you're mm -hmm. doing this with, I'm guessing, mm -hmm. in an informal way maybe. You have a team of four reports and then a larger LDA team. What's the amount of time and what rhythm are you creating for yourself to just stop and think about this for all those people? Like, is it a long the way thing? Are you building in some percentage of time and some rhythm to, to do this? Like, how does that look for you? Yeah, practice? that's a good question. Um, I'd say, you know, some, some of it uh, comes very naturally to me. Like in the course of a day, if I see something, I don't have to think about it as much as I did a few years ago. You know, some of it's like stuff I've been working on. Um, showing appreciation, for example. Um, I was appreciating them, but nobody knew it. <laughs> Go figure, right? <laughs> you know, gotta open your mouth, get it out. Um, sometimes I will, I will devote time to that. One year, I just thought at Thanksgiving, I'm just going to write a note to every person on the team. I didn't get it done till Valentine's Day. <laughs> but on Valentine's Day, they all landed in their home mailboxes. And the, the impact of that was phenomenal. So that took a little time, right? Um, in general, I think uh, um, I'm thoughtful about the position focus conversations. Um, and I'll be thinking about them a, a while before we actually sit down to have them. I only look at them for about 30, mi uh, 30 minutes prior. Mm -hmm. um, but there's thought going into it. So if you're a person that doesn't think about that naturally, I would schedule it. Um, but proportionally for me, I'll see things along the way and go, okay, note to self, next position focus conversation. Let's talk about expanding this part of this person's strength make them responsible for more. So for me, it's pretty constant. Um, with my peers, um, it's a, a little bit different scenario, I think, because we don't meet face-to-face -face that often. We're following up work on each other. Being appreciative, that I think, is fairly normal. Um, and then um, if there's something specific that either I've been offended by or that you know something needs to be called out, I try to do that as soon as possible um, as it's coming up. So the majority of my work is a lot of times on uh, initiatives uh, and actually doing the stuff behind the scenes that is not the fun bit in order to make the fun bit happen. So that's a little bit of the, some of this stuff is just as a leader, as a servant, that's kind of what you do. You make the space to do the stuff that's not as fun, so the stuff that is fun. Someone else had a hand. Okay. I know your team, this whole department has been doing a great job on the position focus. Um, that's one of the tools that you have uh, at your disposal. The other would be any kind of particular uh, training or stuff like that that you offer. I know Kelly does a good job on offering some of the leader development stuff to you. So be thoughtful about the resources that you have. And when you think about that one person in your head, and you're writing that list of strengths, and you're thinking of the vision for it, may the Lord give you the specific action steps that you need to take with them to see them become all you can be. And may that be multiplied across your entire team. Thank you.